My guest today is Jean Lang. Jean, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you, David. It's nice to be here. Uh, It's nice to have you. Tell me, Jean, what do you do for a living? (laughs) Well, these days I'm doing something different than the last time I talked to you. Um, These days I'm working uh, for a company in Pittsburgh slash San Francisco uh, called Mm -hmm. Kiabi. Two great cities. (laughs) Yeah, two great cities. Great coasts, great synergy together. Um, (laughs) Kiabi works to unlock the value in America's aged home market. Uh, what, what we do is we provide loans to real estate investors to help them with flipping houses to, to sell them to other people. Um, we're also involved in, in rental loans sometimes, but our sort of main product is that uh, fix and flip loan for people. And we uh, do a better job of it than, than other folks who do that by uh, using technology to, to make it better, uh, to make our gathering information process smoother to make risk decisions. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, using both our proprietary data from seven years of doing loans and also uh, information that's publicly available to, to make good decisions. Um, there, there are some cool statistics. I've been working here about six months. I don't have them right in my brain, but uh, there are some cool statistics about how often fix and flips usually succeed, which is a lower percentage than the percentage of fix and flips that succeed when you're working with Kiabi, which is, I think, 93%. Ah. You should Um, put that in your marketing literature. (laughs) I'm sure it's there somewhere. (laughs) Um, What I do there is I'm a a TPM, a technical program manager. I always have to define the P because there's so many P's that you can be as a TPM. Um, And it's the first time I've ever been one of those. Um, And as I understand the job, uh, which I've been in for about six months now, um, what I do is uh, help to make big projects happen uh, or initiatives for the engineering group um, that aren't the responsibility of any one team. And the thing that I'm I'm responsible for making happen is helping to hire junior engineers uh, to make that that work for our team and for the people we're hiring and also to help all new engineers coming into the team succeed and to support them as they get started uh, in the engineering group. That sounds like a lot of fun and very interesting, but uh, that's not what I came here to talk to you about. I, when we when we, we were talking about doing a show together, I asked you, what's a good topic? And you mentioned a few. One of them was the history of JavaScript, and that was pretty interesting because all I know about JavaScript's history is some guy named Brendan who wrote it in 10 minutes on the back of a postage stamp, and it took over the web. And it's, it's maybe it's more than that, or is it? Well, that's uh, that's definitely my understanding of how it got started also and yeah. how it continued also with the taking over the web. Um, yeah. But, you know, uh, earlier this year, um, I was looking for a talk to give for the Pittsburgh Tech Fest. I wanted to get involved with it. And I offered them mm-hmm. a couple of topics. And they said, you know, we'd like to have you as a speaker because our, our folks say good things about you. I love that. I love having a reputation of, of being a good person to talk to. It, um, it's out, you have a good <laughs> reputation in Chicago, by the way. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, but uh, we'd like a less topic, based, like how to do this thing. They didn't like my regex talk, which I love. Um, or my uh, how to do a linked list talk, which I also really enjoy giving. Uh-huh. I said, uh, we'd like something more mm, complex. And I said, huh, what's complex? And more complex I went than looking... regex? <laughs> <laughs> and I went looking for a topic that I wanted to know about, a question that I had. And um, something else that I do in life besides my job is uh, I volunteer at a local uh, software development boot camp, Academy of Pittsburgh. Uh-huh. Um, and... Uh, besides people being confused about regular expressions and linked lists, you know, we teach several languages throughout the course of the course. And uh, we do, you know, C sharp and they, they learn about a, a typed language and about curly braces mm-hmm. um, and about compiler errors. And then we move to Ruby and they learn about, you know, a dynamic and interpreted language and 
you know, how it feels like you can do anything and you're making it up and there are so many different ways to do anything, <laughs> but there's some of the same concepts right. and they're starting to feel a little confident about what a programming language is. And then pow, JavaScript and <laughs> everything. <laughs> ev there, there are some things that you can do that are similar, but uh, there's a lot of different stuff in JavaScript. And, and, you know, people ask questions. Uh, why is it this way? And I, I didn't really have a good answer for that. So I set out with this talk to answer the question, JavaScript, why are you? Why are you the way you are? Um, hmm. uh, so that's that's sort of the, the genesis of it. Um, and what did, you, what did why, you learn? Why I started learning about it. I learned a lot because uh, I didn't have a lot of background in this. I didn't know the answer to this question, which is why it made it an interesting talk for me to, to try to give. Um, <clears throat> what did I learn about JavaScript? Well, like you, I read a lot of articles on the internet. Um, and then I worked on sort of the distilling that into something that I could, uh, talk about during the course of an hour long talk. Um, the, let me, let me skip straight ahead to the end to what I learned, right? Okay. The reason yeah. why JavaScript, <laughs> the reason why JavaScript is so, I'm going to pause for a second. Pause. Here we are. I'll unpause in a, in a moment. The reason um, why JavaScript is so was the original title of the talk, but it's very hard to pronounce that question mark, exclamation mark, pound symbol, dollar sign, question mark oh, that like goes there at the end. Like when you replace cuss words with the, those symbols. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I, I want to give you my best personal speaker tip, which is okay. when you've got a talk that you need to title, the best way for me to do it that I found is to go to my local coding community and explain what the talk is about and then brainstorm with everyone there what the best title for the talk is. Um, long story short, what we came up with for this one is what the heck my script, which what I think the heck is my script. I like it a lot, <laughs> which I think is really wonderful. Um, and I want to give Dan Oswalt from Code and Supply uh, credit, full credit for that, that name that, that he came up with there. Uh, so, Unpause. Okay. Uh, so this talk, what what the heck, my script, right, is about figuring out why JavaScript is the way that it is. And the answers that I came up with um, were, were were twofold at the end of the talk. The first reason why JavaScript is the way that it is is because of the web. You said it grew up with the web, right? And that is yeah. very true. The development of of the the internet and the development of JavaScript are inextricably linked together, and it explains yeah. a lot about what happened with it and how it has changed and why there are so many strange things in it. Um, and the other answer, there are two sticky notes on the slide. Mm -hmm. That's my oh pause. That's my second uh, great speaker tip that I have uh, for this from this year that sticky I've learned notes. this year is that instead of bullet points, you can use sticky notes as your bullet points, and it ah. just uh, I'm very pleased with this slide technique. I may steal I feel, that. <laughs> I feel very winning about it. <laughs> I've been using Miro sticky notes to create my slides lately. All right. All right. Unpause. My two my two sticky notes on the slide say web, and the other one says lure, L-U-R-E. Um, All right. Like a fishing when, lure. Yes, yes. The thing about JavaScript is when it started, it was created to say, hey, it's okay. Come on in try this out. It's not so hard. Oh. You can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you're not a, a programmer, yeah. you can, no, you can make something happen with this. Yeah. Um, that's and why, it has that's only... why it's called script. Script. Right, right, right. And it has only gradually become so much more complex and wrapped around with conventions and frameworks and things. It started out as a thing intended to lure people in and say, hey, you can do you too can do this. You can make it right. work. Um, and I think that those two things are the answer to what the heck in the script um, person. Ah. But I got there by, you know, I thought this talk was going to be about how do you make good decisions in this world that we're in with JavaScript, where you have a million thousand frameworks mm -hmm. uh, that you could use and you have different versions and there are so many libraries that do the same thing. How do you make intelligent choices in this world of JavaScript that we exist in? Mm -hmm. That's what I thought that the talk was going to end up being about. Um, but I discovered that the most interesting part to both me and the people attending it was just the history. What, what happened with JavaScript as, as, 
as it grew, as it progressed along the way. Oh, yeah, we haven't talked about the history yet. <laughs> yes, that's true, we haven't. Uh, let's see, what did I learn? Um, is this a venue where I can show you a slide, or is that not a thing that we do on the show? You can show me a slide, sure. You're going to share your screen? Okay. Do it. Yeah, absolutely. Let me, uh, let, me, let me find the one I want to show you. As long as it has Post-it notes on it, I'm good with it. Does this one have post-it notes on it? Oh, this one doesn't. It's a timeline. I'll show you. We'll skip through to it quickly. Share content. Okay. What the heck, Muscrip? There we go. <laughs> yep, there, there it is. That's that's my uh, presentation there. Yeah, here you go. Here's my uh, how you ask for a slide description there. Here's my good uh, sticky notes uh, technique. Uh, and here's here's the story of this whole presentation. And, uh, you know, I... I give you evidence that JavaScript is such a screwy language with some weird stuff going on in it that we encounter and say, what is even happening in JavaScript? <laughs> um, but even though it's so screwy, it's everywhere. Uh, it's it is. I think it's the most popular programming language in the world. If it's not, that's what it's, that number it's one is the all top about. three. Oh, it, it is number one and has been since 2012. So wow. yeah, look, I'm, I'm cheating with my speaker notes down here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't checked in 2022, but in 2021, it was still the most popular language. And I don't think that that's changed. Um, this 97.5% here is the percentage of websites that use JavaScript, uh, according wow. to this link right here. So, you know, it, it truly is everywhere. And how did it get yeah. to be that way when it's so screwy? And uh, the answer is in this history. And like, check it out here. If we look at my speaker notes, do, 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 do. this slide just goes on for a long time talking about that. Let me pull it up uh, um, on a on a slide well, show version. Well, it is here. 25 years. That's a lot, lot to cover. So it, for invention, sure. Okay, 1995. Yeah, yeah. It was invented. Some uh, that was the Brendan guy, and the I think he worked yep. for Netscape Navigator at the time. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. And that story is you know widely available on on the internet that they. Uh, needed a, a language, and he said, oh, I can do that, and sat down and wrote it in, in 10 days, and phew, there's JavaScript, and, and, uh -huh. and now we're good. Um, and the name was a, a sort of collaboration with marketing who knew that this Java thing was popular, uh, uh -huh. and so maybe they can sort of ride on the coattails of that and, and, and use it. Um, and, and, you but, know, one of the screwy things – oh, sorry, go ahead. That did cause a lot of confusion that uh, <laughs> Java and JavaScript have similar names. It still causes a lot of confusion, for sure. Um, I, I see that with students. I see that with recruiters. Um, I see that with um, non-technical people that I talk to a lot. At, uh, it's a decision that has, a, has had a far-reaching consequence. Yeah. And, you know, another confusion that I was confused about sort of earlier in my career was JavaScript, ECMAScript. What, what is that? What's going on there? Why, why are there two names? Why, what are the differences between them? Um, and... I only really clarified that completely in my mind while I was preparing for this talk um, oh, when I learned that ECMAScript is the standard that's written mm -hmm. out um, and JavaScript is an implementation of it. Uh, um, you know, when you're, you're writing JavaScript in a, you know, in an HTML document, you, you use a script tag with a, a source attribute on it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, sorry, with a lang attribute on it that says lang equals JavaScript. Um, it was intended to be one of many possible things that go in a script tag, but it became uh, the de facto standard of the web. Right. Um, there, there were other ones, uh, you know, Flash, uh, for example, or ActionScript were both mm. scripting languages that could could run on the page, but uh, JavaScript ran them over and became the the king of the browser, the thing that happens. Right. And that didn't really change over the course of its history. Um, until we get to, you know, very close to present day, this last interesting uh, speech bubble on here about WebAssembly, mm -hmm. which is a new style of running code, you know, in your browser. Um, and, and that's, a, a, to me, a big change from, from what's happened over the, the last 25 years there. Um, this, this new language coming in as a possibility. There. Oh, so, um, so it, was a, it was an evolution for 20 years, and then all of a sudden it was a revolution when WebAssembly came along. <laughs> That's what it seems like to me. I think we'll have to see what happens with, with WebAssembly and with other possible ways of, of running scripts in, in the browser on your web page there. Right. Uh, but I, I was talking about ECMAScript, right? ECMAScript is yes. the standard. 
JavaScript is an implementation of that standard. The reason they didn't get named the same thing is that uh, nasty confusion over Java versus Java, JavaScript. Um, and they said, mm, this is, well, we can't really have this. We're going to call the standard ECMAScript. Um, these, these dots down at the bottom, the, the green dots there, represent uh -huh. years that are releases of ECMAScript. Okay of the ECMAScript standard and things that changed in them. And I think that the the, the timing on those is, is kind of interesting and also yeah. something that I learned about. It wasn't really a, a steady progress of, of things happening. It, it came in these these fits and starts there. Yeah. Um, lots of changes at, at the beginning of the standard and then this this one in 2009 and then a really big one in 2015 and it has continued to change since then. There's still new releases of, of ECMAScript coming out here. Let's I wonder see some if, other uh, if uh, the, the demise of Netscape and then Internet Explorer just taking over the web and essentially taking over the market, of the browser market, is the reason why there's that big gap between about, what, 1998 and 2006, about an eight-year gap. Yeah. Um, the... The... Thing that I saw going on there in, in the history uh, when when I was reading about it, and, you know, I don't know that I have a comprehensive view. I wasn't uh, paying attention to what was happening with JavaScript during that time. I, I like you, went and read a whole bunch of articles about it in order <laughs> to prepare for this. But what I uh, understand to have been happening there is that people were sort of figuring out how to use it because wow. the you know the internet isn't that much older than this. I don't have the year at my fingertips. But, you know, at first it was documents that you were looking at. And then yeah. this concept of like linking between documents was new. And the whole concept of, of presentation and, and CSS and changing how things looked was also like a big new thing. Right. And then very soon after that, JavaScript comes along and starts to be used. And there's still this whole, what do we use this internet for? What what can we do with it? What's happening? Because this is before all the things that we take for granted and think of as normal parts of our life um, that, that yeah. happen on the internet now. You're uh, right. The, uh, uh, there was a big transition. That was a revolutionary transition. The web changed from just linking and sharing documents to mm -hmm. an, uh, an actual platform to deploy applications to. I can yes. run my accounting software inside of this browser through the internet. That was... That was crazy talk 25 and, years ago. And I think some of that is what's happening in, in that this big gap here is people figuring out what they can even use JavaScript for and, and how and, and changing the way that they write for and, and use the web um, in that way. So that's my understanding of that big gap there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Seems plausible. <laughs> some other interesting points on here. Um, uh, thinking about like uh, all of the JavaScript libraries that were really, really useful and mm -hmm. really commonly used. jQuery is an example of that. jQuery yeah. kind of gets a bad rap now when I talk to front end developers. Uh, it, it's uh, thought of as like this huge monster that you don't need to incorporate in your applications. Uh, that's sort of a, a dinosaur, an old style of doing things. But, you know, it was... In this time period when JavaScript wasn't changing, people who wanted to be able to do new things with it needed to pull that in from somewhere. And, okay. and jQuery was really where that happened for a long time. Um, yeah. A lot of the early functionary, uh, sorry, uh, a lot of the early functionality of, of jQuery uh, got written into JavaScript eventually. Right. If you see those, those new teal dots um, after that. But at first, that was the way that new functionality got in and, and became useful. That was the way that we dealt with the proliferation of browsers and, and yeah. you know, the, the ability to run the similar JavaScript functionality on different browsers that had different capabilities. Um, it was a really important step in, in the evolution of, uh, of JavaScript. And, and jQuery is, in fact, still pretty important. I have some uh, statistics back on the speaker notes that I can't see right now about uh, how much jQuery is still in use. And it's it's pretty huge. Oh yeah, jQuery was really significant for me because it it sort of lowered the barrier to entry into JavaScript. I was really yeah. bad at JavaScript until <laughs> I started using jQuery, and then that made it easy enough for me to overcome and 
the, 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 that initial bump <laughs> yeah. and start actually writing applications. Absolutely. Yeah. And JavaScript is very powerful. Uh, but with that power comes uh, complexity and confusion, and uh, some help with that <laughs> is welcome. <laughs> right. Um, the the interesting uh, the, so the next bubble along here is Node.js. That's when JavaScript yeah. moved from in the browser and dealing with browser uh, concerns uh, to being something that you can run on many platforms. Uh, Node.js, as as you know, is is a framework that allows you to framework a runtime library that allows you to run JavaScript outside of a web browser, just on a server or on a computer, and uh, sort of moved it into a similar class as, as other programming languages that could be run on a server. And that's really interesting because up until that point, JavaScript had been for the web. It evolved right. with the web. It was the, all that functionality in jQuery that people needed and used was because people were using it on the web. Um, but then they wanted to be able to program you know, their server applications in the, in the same language that they were using for their front end applications. And that that node.js change was, a, you know, a, a really huge one that that moved JavaScript. Uh, now it can run on basically any platform <laughs> that exists. Um, yeah. I have some uh, some Raspberry Pis uh, helping me to unlock my doors that are, are running JavaScript code. Uh, that's that's not doing, you know, document doc get element by ID. It's doing, hey, pay attention to this API and and uh, send uh, send a signal to the pin to to open the lock when you're ready. Mm. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Electron is a similar change like that. Moves it to uh, the ability to create desktop apps. Um, right. TypeScript is cool uh, because it is the second implementation of ECMAScript. Um, TypeScript came from Microsoft. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you knew that. I know you work for Microsoft. I, I did know that. <laughs> oh, cool. Excellent. Um, and I was surprised to find it out. I, I don't know where I thought it came from. Uh, but it, as something interesting about this whole history of JavaScript along the way. You know what? I'm going to take this slide away and look at your face again. That's what okay. I'd like to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop sharing there. Um, All right. <clears throat> something interesting along the way about this whole JavaScript evolution is it's not just one group being in charge of JavaScript along the way. Right. Um, all sorts of different standards organizations and people um, and like open source authors and uh, not just standards organizations, but other organizations like Microsoft have contributed along the way to to what makes JavaScript what it is. A lot of other languages have a more central control, like there's a group of people who are in charge of the language and make it what it is. Sure. Um, C sharp, for example. Uh, Ruby is, is my first example when I think of it. I okay. can name, you know, some of the, the creators of it and contributors to it. And there's like the mailing list that you go to and and there are regular meetings where people are, are talking about how it changes. Hmm. JavaScript has been more of a, a community effort. Um, hmm. As it grew up with the web, everyone wanted to use it with the web. And so everyone worked on it and did things for it. Um, and I think that's kind of a cool thing about uh, is something that's contributed to its popularity is that it's, from everyone, everyone wanted to use it, so everyone worked on it. Uh, so TypeScript from my, Microsoft is the second yeah. implementation of ECMAScript that stuck around. Mm. Um, so uh, that that for me was an interesting way to understand it because I just thought of TypeScript as uh, you know typed JavaScript. That's right. You know, um, but uh, it, it made sense to me to to think of it when I read about it while researching this presentation as as uh, another implementation of ECMAScript that also had types associated with it. Um, something cool that came along with TypeScript was the concept of transpilation or transcompilation, mm -hmm. where um, instead of compiling a language to bytecode or, uh, you know, to an intermediate language, it's uh, translating from one source to another source. So uh, the transpiler for TypeScript 
takes TypeScript and transpiles it into JavaScript, and machines already know how to run JavaScript. Um, and what a cool word, what a cool concept, transpilation. Transp- yeah, it is, it is pretty yeah. cool. And so it gives you the, that, that safety of yeah. uh, mm-hmm. compile time checking uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and also the advantage of the ubiquity of JavaScript so it can run in just about any browser. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so, so it, it's, you know, some of the things that I learned about along the way or thought about on the on this timeline were, uh, you know, um, where JavaScript could run over time. And it started out in Netscape Navigator and then spread to so many browsers and changed and then sort of came back together with more standards and then and then spread out to many different platforms <laughs> and then, uh, you know, became <clears throat> we started developing when you think about JavaScript libraries, there's not just jQuery and Lodash and things that provide, you know, f- useful functionality that a language might need. There's also all all of the frameworks. One thing oh, yeah. I ask people to talk about, to think about in this presentation about why JavaScript is screwy is, you know, pick your favorite language. Maybe maybe you think of C Sharp. Maybe I think of Ruby, right? Um, how many, uh, you know, frameworks can you think of for writing web applications in that language. And then compare that number to the number that you can think of for writing JavaScript. Oh, yeah. um, there there was a period where every other day a new framework would come out. It yeah, seems to but, have slowed down, thankfully. But <laughs> it, it was overwhelming at one time. Absolutely. I still feel overwhelmed by it. The list is just... <laughs> um, yes. Boy, I lost my train of thought. Uh, the uh, we were talking about how JavaScript sort of expands and contracts and expands into new places oh, yeah. and contracts and standardizes again. And that that's a, a trend that you sort of see along the way of its history as it grows. Um, I was also looking at, you know, where uh, single page apps started coming in, which was, you, you know, a big buzzword back in like 2012, something like that. Wow. Um, and and was a change in the way that the web worked that was uh, pretty pretty fundamental. Um, and that that fed some of that proliferation of frameworks. Um, yeah, I think no. uh, a lot of it. Things like Backbone and Angular and yep. Knockout. And, uh, they, they, they were designed primarily to address that, to be able to create single-page applications. Yeah. Uh, I attended a great presentation at CodeMash a couple of years ago about uh, several different SPA frameworks and, and what they did and how they were different from each other and how they worked um, that sort of helped me to start understanding that that concept. Um, mm-hmm. Of those frameworks, I've mostly worked in React, but I've, you know, I've, I have friends <laughs> in, the, in the different constellation of, of uh, JavaScript world. You get together and argue about which one's better. <laughs> yeah, which one's better, right? So that comes back to that question that I thought that I was going to answer in the course of this presentation, which is, you know, how do I make good choices in this world that I exist in? And yeah. the conclusion, that slide is so small compared to the history slide, which I probably talked about for 20 minutes uh, in the course <laughs> of the talk, right? Um, I don't know how long I've talked about it now. But what it comes down to for me how do i make good choices about javascript is one javascript is a totally reasonable choice to make it's extremely popular and useful and you will find resources about it and there are people working in it and it's progressing totally reasonable choice for a programming language um and then two how do i make good choices about it well same way you make choices about any other programming tool that you're making you know, you think about the, the quality attributes that you're looking for, the, the type of thing you're trying to build. You look at the resources and examples that are available and, and the rate of change that's happening in, in the framework you're looking at and choose something that, that fits your needs. Um, at one interesting thing about making choices about JavaScript, I think, is looking at the reason that the framework was built. So if you think about like React versus Angular, right? Why would you choose one over the other? But they're both JavaScript frameworks. Um, React came from Facebook. And what Facebook has is many different teams working together on one app, needing to not step on each other 
as they work on separate parts of it. And so React is based on these components that are separate from each other wow. and able to work separately and update separately so that multiple different teams can work on the same thing. And if that's a need you that you had, maybe React is a good fit for you. Um, Angular is from Google and um, they, they were trying to make sort of uh, a product that is a, a little more, it, 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 it was used to make Gmail originally, I think. Ooh, I don't Maybe. feel quite backed up on this. G- but Gmail is like the uh, canonical single page application. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and what they were trying to build there was something that's a little more uh, corporate It's weird to think of Gmail as corporate but it, you know, it's this standard, um, traditional platform that, that has to, uh, you, you know, it, it doesn't have that thing of Facebook where you want to update this part and then update this part. And over here, uh, it's, uh, we're all doing the same thing on one page. Let's make it work. Um, and if that's what the kind of thing that you're trying to build, maybe that's a more appropriate framework for you. Um, <laughs> So I think that's the one sort of consideration for me with JavaScript that's different than other languages is thinking about why was this framework created and by whom and do my needs match that one? Um, I I really applaud the fact that you studied history, not for the reasons that I study history, which is just to learn <laughs> to find something entertaining and to learn a bit of trivia, but you've actually found an application of it. And you've learned something that you can apply to your daily life and your job. I think that the the thing that I got most out of learning about this for for this purpose um, was really an answer to that original question: Why is JavaScript so? <laughs> <laughs> and and you know the the answer is that that popularity as it grew up as the singular scripting language for the web that everyone wanted to use and the lure that pulled people into it to try to use it and then to try to do the things they wanted to do with it. And then people tried to build structure uh, around it like other programming languages had that gave them other things they were interested in. And, And that whole everything interacting with that popularity and and the popularity of the web growing um, made right. it into the amazing mishmash that it is. <laughs> <laughs> JavaScript uh, is still not my favorite language, but it does have a fascinating history. What is your favorite language? Oh, well, Ruby is my favorite programming okay. language. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> In Ruby, yeah. they wouldn't replace those cuss words. They've actually just used <laughs> cuss words. That's that's <laughs> That's been my experience whenever I've gone to a Ruby conference. Sure, sure. <laughs> What I like about Ruby is um, how much I feel like I am expressing myself in human readable thought when when huh. I write it or I read it. It feels uh, more more human to me than other programming languages. That sounds like I mean, a topic for a future show. <laughs> I I also like that it, I'm very familiar with it. Sure. Um, and how can you not like Matt's is nice, so we are nice as a community <laughs> slogan. I like that one. I haven't heard yeah. it, but I like it. <laughs> yep. Well, Jean, it's always a pleasure talking to you, and it has been a pleasure today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. It was uh, nice to come talk about this again. <laughs> Techno-frenzology.